at the age of 17, I graduated from high school and started at Brandeis University in Waltham, Massachusetts, where I majored in history. I was there for uh, three and a half years, but I did one semester at the University of California at Berkeley just to try it out. Then I went back to Brandeis. Um, this was before Berkeley became Berkeley. <laughs> um, at that point, it was largely a, state run, a large state-run school dominated by um, uh, fraternities and sororities. And then it changed. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and um, I majored in history, intellectual history to be specific, which is the history of uh, evolution of ideas. That's always been my orientation. That's my PhD is actually in intellectual history also. <laughs> History of religion, history of science, to be precise. Um, and uh, simultaneously with starting, starting the study of uh, starting school, I started doing a more uh, vigorous study of astrology, which I'd been exposed to for several years prior to that by my father, who, was, who had backed into it, as I always like to put it. Um, Several years before that, he'd had a heart attack and was in bed for quite a bit. In those days, heart patients spent a lot of time in bed. And um, he started studying the stock market. And he noticed certain funny rhythms. And he started putting in things like the phases of the moon, New York City tide levels, and found a lot of correlations. So he started putting more and more astronomical data in and backed into astrology. Um, and I might add, he did fairly well with the market. <laughs> I mean, he didn't, he didn't make a fortune because he was more interested in finding out how things worked than doing what was safe. But uh, he consistently made money. Um, so in the fall of 1960, I started, uh, my father got me all the necessary books to really start studying astrology, and I started studying it more aggressively. Uh, but I did a, I did a very, uh, I did not start studying conventional astrology at all, which is why I still have this penchant for not doing conventional astrology. I never did. Uh, he did heliocentric astrology, and with a certain rather strange combination with geocentric astrology. But anyway, that got me started in the study of astrology. Then he died in 1963. And uh, while I continued studying over the next several years, the study was less intense because, frankly, I had nobody to talk to. I'd already begun to meet conventional astrologers at that point and discovered that what I was doing, what they were doing, was very different. The only thing we had in common was correlating things with planetary motions, and we did have birth charts in common, but it was totally different. Then in 1972, well, excuse me, then in the middle there, I spent a year at Princeton Graduate School in the year of 67, 68, where I was studying history of science. And the department at that time was headed by uh, Thomas Kuhn, he of the paradigm. So in other words, I was in the perfect place, but I only stayed there a year, because I decided at that point I did not want to become an academic. Uh, then in 1972, my stepmother informed me of an astrology conference in New York, a couple of them, would I like to come up and attend them with her? She was into it too. And I did, and uh, that's where I, I first met Charles Jane, who was a very prominent astrologer of the previous generation. My father had known him quite well, actually. My father knew quite a few of the New York astrologers, Charles Jane, Chuck Emerson, um, Hans Nigemann, the Iranian astrologer. In fact, I would say, if anything, Hans Nigemann was the family astrologer at that point, <laughs> uh, and several others um, that you probably wouldn't have heard of. And uh, it was like, you know, somebody had opened up uh, opened up the future, and I realized this was the only thing I wanted to do. So uh, I spent a year trying to figure out how to get away with it. Um, actually, no, I didn't come to think about that. That was the prior, previous year. I was the year of wandering. I was coming into my Saturn return, and within a week of my Saturn return, I started being a professional astrologer. I'd been studying it for 11 years already, but I didn't become a professional for a long time. Then I moved to New York for a year where I started working with the New York Astrology Center. Um, the lady who gives the Mark Edmund Jones Award it was one of the principals of the New York Astrology Center at that time. I've known her since 1972. Um, I don't know if you heard the story, but um, the headline in the paper said, you know, in the Mercury Power said, long overdue. She thought she'd given me one about 15 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's why she hadn't given me one. She thought she already had. You would assume. Yeah, no, she said that. She finally had it. it yeah, had yeah. It a long time ago, right? Yeah. Um, but so, at any rate, from that time on, I was up to my eyeballs in astrology. I spent a year in New York, then moved back to the Boston area. And there I met uh, through mutual friend in New York, actually very important mutual friend, Neil Mickelson, connected me to a guy named Frank Malinsky, who was looking for somebody to write computer text for him. And to make a long story short, the computer text led to planets and composite, planets and youth, and planets and transit. Uh, he also had the brilliant idea, because he'd been, done this with another author, uh, Frank Pelletier, of uh, publishing the computer text as books for astrologers as well. And that's where those books came from. And uh, that went on for several years in that manner. And then in the, uh, let's see, late 70s, uh, Astro uh, Astrographic Services, it was, as it was first called, was founded. And that became Astrolabe software. And um, that was, uh, things went in a fairly even keel until Project Hindsight emerged in the early 90s. And, uh, uh, I, I was, Robert Schmidt, Robert Zoller, and I founded Project Hindsight. Um, the, the, the name of my company, Arhat, actually came into being at that point. It was originally Association for the Retrieval of Historical Astrological Texts. And um, uh, when, when Robert Schmidt and I came to a parting of the ways in 1996, seven, 1997, um, I I kept the name Arhat, and he kept Project Hindsight. But they were actually two different terms for the same movement at the beginning, although that fact has been a bit obscured. The, uh, and that's how I came to the attention of Kepler. I knew about the Kepler College creation process because I'd been speaking at Norwalk every year for years, and I kept hearing about this process, and I, of course, expressed my interest. Uh, I didn't expect to be on its faculty ever because it was so, the faculty at that point was entirely derived from the Washington State area. Um, and then when, the, when it was finally announced the school would open, I was, surprised to, I was surprised to be asked to teach the introductory history course, the ancient history part, along with uh, Nick Campion and Demetra George. And uh, I accepted. Uh, they originally wanted Robert Schmidt uh, because of his involvement with Greek astrology, but they found Robert Schmidt's requirements not easily met, so they turned to me. And I was perfectly, I would have been perfectly happy to keep right on teaching history, but then, then there, be, there came the problem. The problem was that without a master's degree, I could teach only one term of one course per year. So um, I started looking about for places to study medieval history, which is what I decided I wanted to do. And um, I called up a professor of medieval history at George Mason University, which is the State University of Virginia, one of them. And she said, you don't want to come here. You want to go to Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C., which is where she'd gotten her doctorate, uh, because they have one of the finest medieval history programs in the United States. And most people don't know this. This is not a school that is terribly known for its academic achievement. But there are certain areas where it's unbelievably strong, and this was one of them. Uh, anything to do with medieval is unbelievably strong there. That and the science department. <laughs> philosophy department's pretty good, too. Um, I have enormous respect for their philosophy department. My standing joke is they don't study medieval history at Catholic University. They do it, and they do it very well. <laughs> I mean, it's modernized a bit, but they, they, they actually apply Aquinas, Duns Scotus, and people like that to philosophical problems. And uh, these guys are unbelievably sharp. <laughs> um, and they can really, really pull the rug out from under modern philosophy. Well, this is obviously something I was looking for. <laughs> um, so I went back to school with the idea of getting at least a master's so I could teach more at Kepler. And uh, it became obvious, well, it was obvious in the beginning that if I could get a doctorate, I should. And you may say, well, why was it a question? Well, in the history program at Catholic University, you do not automatically go for a doctorate. You have to be invited after you've done your after you've been there a little while. They've decided whether you're doctorate material, and they decided I was. So um, I've been doing that ever since.
at this point, I am no longer an amateur translator. I'm a professional. And if, it, and if I showed you my most recent translation work versus my earliest, you'd see the difference immediately. Uh, my translations now read well without distorting the sig meaning of the text. My earlier ones read like translations literally from the Latin, which they were. <laughs> you have to understand the sciences and the humanities are a little different in their traditions. Um, the sciences um, uh, are much more likely to be dogmatic about ideas, oddly enough. The humanities, what happened in the humanities is the children of the 60s became the establishment. And that made, created a great deal more openness to astrology. When I was in graduate school in 67, 68, the word I'd received was that if anybody knew of my interest in astrology, my academic career was over. In 2002, uh, the revolution had occurred, and while doing astrology was not held in particularly high esteem, the study of its historical and social significance was a perfectly legitimate field and was already becoming a thriving academic specialty. For the most part, I hasten to add, done rather badly because the academics in question knew almost nothing about astrology. In fact, my PhD dissertation is partly designed to make that point. Um, and I made it in my proposal, too. I said that to be a historian of astrology requires a knowledge of astrology similar to the knowledge of physics required of a historian of physics. And it is as technical a discipline. It just doesn't have quite the cachet. <laughs> so uh, when my teachers found, uh, my teachers didn't find out about my interest in astrology until I'd already made it clear to them that I was a competent student. And by that time, um, the reaction was far out. Uh, you know, just play the game according to the rules and there are no problems. Nobody has given me a hard time at Catholic University of America <laughs> about my being involved in astrology. In fact, there are two other historians of astrology in the school. That's amazing. That says a lot, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. History of astrology is a perfectly legitimate academic field. And at the last History of Science Society uh, conference in Arlington, Virginia, last November, um, there was a whole track on Saturday morning of nothing but the history of astrology. And while we had a small room, we had the highest attendance of any track I saw. The room was full. And the other ones occurred to these big auditoriums, there'd be one or two people. You know? <laughs> astrology has a role to play in society, which is quite independent of whether astrology, quote unquote, works. Um, of course, I assume, I, I believe it does work in the terms that we define it. Um, it doesn't do a lot of the things that people accuse us of claiming that it does. But, uh, I mean, it's not a fortune-telling medium, except occasionally. And that usually designates a person who is in a very rigid situation. But um, astrology is so much an alternative to the mainstream thought patterns of our society that it challenges them. And considering that the mainstream thought patterns of our society are killing the planet, uh, anything that teaches people that the universe is in some meaningful way a living entity and that we must deal with it as a living entity because we are part of that living entity and if it dies, so do we. Well, we can't kill the universe, but we can certainly do on the earth. Um, but I, I think the idea of the universe being kind, uh, some kind of living being and that we can have converse with it or discourse with it, to use the more fashionable term, is incredibly important. And uh, I, can, I can describe this by uh, one, of my, one of my comments, sort of aphoristic comments about astrology. Um, astrology gives you a day-to-day -day experience that what the mystic said is true. We in the universe are one but we get it on a day-to-day -day experiential level. We don't just get it from occasional great bursts of insight. Every time you do a chart, you are seeing evidence that we in the universe are one. That's a very revolutionary statement because our, our culture's attitude toward the universe is a collection of disconnected parts. If we can create uh, persons who are recognized for whatever the legitimacy of astrology may be, that insofar as astrology is legitimate, these people are legitimate, uh, and, and we can actually create a recognized astrological profession in this country, that would, be, that, that would take care of the problem.
because there, there are enough astrologers in this country if they were all graduates of a recognized academic institution, not necessarily Kepler, but uh, to justify the existence of these academic institutions. Now, lest you think this is totally crazy, the Federation of Australian Astrologers is recognized by the Australian government as being the legitimate certifying body of professional astrologers, and professional astrologer is a legitimate profession. Now, that doesn't mean every Australian believes in astrology any more than any, every American believes in chiropractic, which is my favorite parallel. Um, but, it mean, but it means that the, there is a way in which astrology has made, uh, created a relationship with the mainstream of society without at the same time, I hasten to add, getting sucked into its faults. The astrologers in Australia are astrologers. They're very well trained. They have no academic training such as Kepler produces. They're vocationally trained, but they are certified professionals. I would like to see certified professional astrologers have both the vocational and the academic training. The model I like to use is uh, similar to that of, of the law and medicine, where you do an undergraduate, ma uh, undergraduate major that leads you to, and then leads you to the profession. Then you go to a school that specializes in the practical aspects of that profession. But of course, I'm not just into the history of astrology, I'm also into the philosophy of astrology. And uh, I have some very, very strong opinions about the history of philosophy, which is one of my fields. Uh, uh, for the PhD in medieval history at Catholic University, you have to have two major fields and two minor fields. The major fields are fields in which you are a contributing academic scholar. The minor fields are fields you could teach if somebody needed you to. The minor fields, in my case, are history of medieval philosophy and the history of the early medieval Arabic and Byzantine worlds. In other words, I've got the transmission period covered there. And my major fields are the history of, uh, and I'll combine them, history of late medieval and early modern religion and science. Cover it again. <laughs> There's no question that my dissertation is squarely in the middle of my majors. Uh, one of the things about Kepler, uh, one, uh, in the last couple of years I've begun noting finally, the, outside of Kepler, the arrival of younger people in astrology. There was a period there where we were afraid that we were going to die of old age as a community. Uh, I actually have always known there were young people involved in astrology, but they tended not to associate with the traditional institutions of American astrology as they've evolved in the 60s and 70s. That's ha changing now. Um, Kepler was the first place where I saw the change happening because Kepler students are, uh, while we have older people at Kepler, Kepler students on average age are a whole lot younger than the average age of the astrological community. Uh, most of you are, of course, not kids right out of high school. Um, but nevertheless, uh, it's a younger crew. And between the Kepler graduates and the non-Kepler younger people in astrology, the future of astrology is in excellent hands. I have no fear for the future at all in that respect. Even if, even if Kepler were not to make it, the future is in good hands because we've already made an impact. People now get the idea. Um, but it would be ever so much better if we did survive and continue contributing to that. Uh, we've already elevated the astrological community, whether the astrological community gets it or not, because we, the, not only do we have these younger people in astrology, but they are uh, quite impatient of a good deal of the sloppiness and slipshod activity that went on in the older astrological community. They want to see it done professionally, and this is great. Professionalism isn't a bad thing. <laughs> I mean, we're all, we're, all the organizations are talking about ethics, and so forth. Uh, well, prof there's more to the profession. Professionalism requires ethics, but there's more to it than that. The best are good. The worst are pretty awful. <laughs> I find myself personally um, almost unable to listen to modern astrology. This doesn't have to do with ancient cultures. Yeah, that's too bad, actually, because it is possible to create thoughtful lectures in the context of modern astrology, but um, there's not a whole lot of that going on. Uh, there are some technical issues in modern astrology where the material is fairly interesting from a technical point of view. Um, 
but the, uh, where modern astrology really did develop something powerful and positive was the philosophy. And uh, there's not a whole lot of that going on. Mostly what you see is uh, warmed over and diluted uh, conventional uh, early 20th century English astrology with a slight new age spin put on it. And yeah, that's, that's pretty unsatisfying stuff. But that's changing. Yes, that's changing. Yes. Partly due to Kepler. Partly due to Kepler and some really high-powered guys, guys and girls outside of Kepler, you know, who are, uh, who whether they came to Kepler or not are definitely fellow travelers. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll single out one obvious candidate, uh, despite issues I may have with the Project Hindsight people have also contributed to this. Their, their, their standards of what constitutes good astrological work, work are much higher than the traditional communities has been. But um, their main deficiency is that they study one narrow aspect of the history of astrology and actually, to some extent, I believe, are taught to have disdain for the rest of it, uh, whereas Kepler covers the whole thing and has, has disdain for none of it, not even the modern. <laughs> yeah, we have a hard time getting enough of any of it, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you guys have taught us well, and yeah. we're going to have to do a lot more of that. Yeah. And um, we're excited about astrology. Mm -hmm. We just want to learn and dig and uncover. And yeah, that's what it takes. Uh, there hasn't been an attitude like that in astrology, except for scattered little pockets in hundreds of years. I mean, I, when I started, even, even before any of this started, when I started doing astrology intensively in the 70s, it was clear that for the first time since the early modern period, first class minds were into astrology. Even, even before any of, the, any of this educational ferment began, I could see the first class minds were getting into astrology. The older generations, they kept the, they kept the torch burning, they, kept, they preserved astrology, very few first-class minds. Rudyard was one. Whatever you may think about his verb verbose style, he was, a, he was an intellectual. Um, the late Hans Nigemann, although nobody thinks of him as one, was actually one of the leading artists of Europe in his day. <laughs> um, and um, as well as being an opera voice coach, which is his main living. Uh, I can think of a few others, um, but the rank and file of well-known established astrologers in the 19th and early 20th centuries uh, were not towering intellects. The last towering intellect I can think of in English astrology was um, Varley, the painter, who was a friend of Blake's. Uh, I don't think his astrology was necessarily terribly intellectual, but he was. Uh, he was a very good astrologer and, as I say, a friend of Blake's and a very fine artist. Um, then you have to go back to the 17th century, and for the and for real intellectual, you have to go back to the 16th. Uh, it's an exciting time in astrology, I think. Yeah, it's different from the 70s. The 70s, for sheer numbers, and uh, that was huge. I mean, there was an AFA convention in San Francisco back in that period in the late 60s which had a, several thousand people. It was, I think, the largest astrology conference that's ever happened, much bigger than this one. I, I'm told. I wasn't there. But then uh, the, the numbers, the fad level of astrology has declined significantly. And that's, I'm okay with that <laughs> uh, because it was... Uh, um, astrology for a period was like Freud in the drawing rooms of the 1920s in America. Uh, you know, was, everybody had a superficial knowledge of it. It was coffee, cocktail conversation and nothing really was going on. But out of that ferment in the 70s, the foundations for something like Kepler were laid. The people who founded Kepler were from that group. And uh, the previous generation wouldn't have done it. They would have had the idea, but they didn't know how to go about it. It took a lot of alignment to get that going. Yeah, well, I mean, I'll give one concrete example of the risk of obsessively stroking a colleague. Um, uh, somebody like Lee Lehman would never have gotten into astrology in the 20s or 30s with her background. But in the, when, when she got into astrology, it was now acceptable for a highly trained intellectual to get into astrology, and she did. <laughs> and that's why Kepler can happen, because that sort of thing happened. So the 70s played a positive role, but the 70s couldn't have done it.